All right. So again, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, we'll be talking today about the um, about that double cloud and how Spectrio saves with uh, some of the services that we provide and how it helps to reduce Snowflake bill. And uh, I, my name is Igor, and I am developer advocate at Double Cloud. I did some backend development, and then I did some science, data science, and then just changed to data. And uh, yeah, uh, right now I'm doing that, and I'm a huge fan of Apache Airflow. Uh, but today we were going to talk about uh, more of streaming side of data processing. Shalesh, would you like to say a few words about yourself, please? Yeah, yeah. First of all, thank you for having me here. My name is uh, Shailesh Karavat. I've uh, been an entrepreneur for the last decade uh, or so, involved in startups and uh, took uh, bootstrap companies and took all the way to different levels of fundraising and acquisition. So, and along the way, won several awards and I've been in the AI um, you know, IoT space and digital signage space and for the last 10 plus years. Would you say that uh, all the businesses that you worked at were like data related or just data adjacent, maybe? Um, yes, yes, I can say that, yeah, more or less, yeah. Cool. Uh, right, let me just uh, start by saying a few words about Double Cloud just to get it out of the door and uh, bring everyone on the same page, and then we will switch to Spectre case. So at Double Cloud, we strongly believe that it shouldn't take a lot of pain to set up your data infrastructure. And we help you build that. And uh, you can basically build a real-time platform for analytics in just one day using our managed open source services. Right now, our main technologies that we provide is uh, Kafka, ClickHouse, and Apache Airflow. And, uh, we provide not only that, but some niceness of how you can connect them and uh, make sure that everything is working together nice and uh, smooth. And uh, in terms of uh, our additional service, we also provide a lot of support. And uh, like you can bring your own cloud and uh, so on. Uh, this is like a high level overview of what services we um, offer. So we have some ingestion and transportation uh, technologies that will help you bring your data from your various sources, uh, like uh, databases, object storage, streaming data, and so on, to our ClickHouse uh, instance, and maybe like to, to Kafka, and then uh, translate it a bit there on the fly. Then you can manage it with Apache Airflow. I'm very excited that we will release it as general availability feature in September. As uh, right now, it's uh, like a preview only mode. And um, uh, we also have some visualization layer and uh, additional things like you can bring your own account and maybe have some uh, different parts of the services deployed in different availability zones or even different providers. We currently support AWS and Google Cloud, and we are hoping to support Azure soon. Uh, but I didn't tell you that. And uh, yeah, just in general, everything that you need for real-time data processing is on our platform and we're focusing on open source and contribute backwards to the, or like upwards to the providers. Uh, the focus of today's talk will be mainly ClickHouse because uh, it's a good uh, solution for real-time analytics and because Spectre uses that. And uh, it's an uh, open source uh, columnar database built uh, with the idea that it should be very performant. The story goes that the folks were very unhappy with MapReduce jobs uh, that they were doing, and then they just uh, sat down and implemented some of the routines in C++ and made, made sure that it sort of works as expected. And it has a, lot, a good uh, set of features, like it can uh, ingest your data relatively fast with low latency. It's a good compression, so it doesn't really blow out your disk space. Uh, it's built from idea that the, uh, it should be distributed, and uh, it even can be used to do some ad hoc analysis on uh, large data sets in real time. We just released a blog post about comparison of uh, how would you use ClickHouse compared to Snowflake. You can find the link uh, on this uh, slide, and uh, all the slides will be sent uh, to participants. 
in a couple of days along with the recording. And uh, yeah, so we mainly, I think one of the main uh, combination that how ClickHouse is used is usually with, uh, in terms of real-time data is connected to Kafka. And uh, we also support that and provide an easy way to set up that. But if you go with uh, ClickHouse double cloud, you get uh, also a lot of um, niceness, like you get automatic updates, backups. There are some uh, easily set up uh, auto scaling. You can set up a hybrid storage. Uh, if your cluster is having a bad time, we have some routines to help it uh, self heal. And we provide some kind of ability setup and configuration for that. Uh, as I said, the data transfer service uh, provides a lot of integrations from, uh, it's like some of them are native, some of them are open source from uh, Airbyte, and uh, you can basically get any source of data inside the inside your real-time platform at Double Cloud. And if you can't, you can reach out to us and we will help you how to design that because we have an awesome team of uh, not only just uh, hardcore technical people, but also solution architects who can provide you like insights on how to set it up. Uh, for example, recently we improved our DynamoDB ingestion uh, layer because more people started using that. And we're constantly like improving things, adding new connections and so on. Because of our focus on open source technologies, uh, we sort of think of ourselves not as a vendor, but more of a, a provider. And uh, we contribute back to some of the open source tools that we use. There are some, uh, on this slide, you can see some of the benchmarks. Like for example, in some use cases, you can get up to hundreds of uh, faster query speeds compared to other database management systems. And uh, if a query compared to Elastic Search, then um, you will get like five times faster. Of course, me being from double cloud and uh, given these benchmarks, you should take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, it's like, should, should be suspicious, but uh, what I can definitely promise is that definitely there will be some support from our side if you join us and uh, we will uh, provide additional uh, support to make sure that your tools are working uh, as much uh, performant as you would like it for your uh, business case. So now uh, I said everything I wanted to say about double count. Uh, let's go to Spectre. Uh, could you please tell a few words of how you use data, like what is Spectre in general, what the business model there? Yeah, so, so Spectre is a um, you know leader in uh, um, customer engagement technology. So if you see on the side, you can see the digital screens that is actually showing a mini board. You know, we do uh, pretty much any kind of. Uh, uh, digital signage, or you know, we call it the digital auto home advertising space. So, you know, uh, we have a software for managing those, um, and these type of screens and playlists and all that. So that's the digital signage piece. We also do content creation. So, you know, any type of content because you, you, you know, content is the king, right? So you always want to have a uh, different kind of content. And the third thing that we do, is, which is our core offering is audience measurement. So, um, uh, understanding the performance of the content, how many people walk by, how many people engage, you know, call to actions, all that kind of stuff. And then we also have some other complementary services like install music, um, you know, on hold music, messaging, you know, like the ads that you hear in Spotify, right? So that's the messaging we call it. So yeah, and um, our data needs has been um, extensive, ranging from you know real time content delivery. Uh, and analytics on the customer behavior, right? So we want to do targeted advertising and things like that. So we need to have a lot of data that we collect from these different endpoints. Um, and the challenge we faced is like the way that the, the large volume of data had been, the, 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 the volume of data had been growing, you know, like and how to efficiently manage them, how to scale them, you know, and to have all this in a both timely and relevant manner. And you're able to take actions based on this data, right? So, yeah, we have about 160,000 endpoints or locations. So, so that's, that's that's a significant amount of data. So, yeah. Before the webinar, uh, for, I asked your permission to take a look on how much you ingest per day, and it's uh, roughly like uh, 50 million rolls uh, per day. Uh, yeah. going through our trans, uh, transformation layer. So it's uh, quite a big data, I would say. 
Uh, so like, what's the data story here? Like, did you start just with one server and then scaled up or uh, was it at some point, like maybe a small server under your table or how that worked? Um, so when we launched uh, in reality, like 10 plus years ago, um, we started it off. Maybe we didn't, we never had, I don't think we ever had like a, on-prem server, we always we started off with cloud in on AWS uh, way back then. Um, so we started off collecting, you know, we call it like thin clients or the edge devices, right? So many many of these screens, if you can think of there is a there is an edge device or a thin client behind the screens in most of the use cases. Uh, sometimes the the screen itself is not enough to run certain things. You know, it runs in OS. Um, so from these kind of devices, I think it was hundreds of devices, um, edge devices and, you know, IOT sensors. We also have computer vision solutions. So we, uh, AI computer vision models that runs on these, uh, edge devices. And we started collecting data for, uh, from hundreds of devices. And it, you know, once we scaled or, you know, we ramped up, it went to thousands of devices and tens of thousands of devices. And now we are more than hundred thousand devices. So. I mean, there was challenges along the way, you know, it's never that easy. Um, and uh, we started off initially with uh, just like anybody else, you know, 10 years ago, relational databases uh, is where we started. And then you kind of start to see issues. And when you have a large amount of data, uh, you run into issues. So then we evolved and here, our next generation of the platform, we moved on to uh, Elastic Cash and then to Spark and then with Databricks Spark. And then after that, we wanted everything in a single centralized. Uh, yeah, we, would, we didn't want to move around the data, right? So we don't want to move from a location to another location to another location, right? We want everything in one place. Uh, then we moved into Snowflake and then, then now with Lika. So that was that's the journey that we had. Yeah, that's... Uh... A lot of technologies to go for, but then again, it's uh, 10, 10 years and a growing field. So it's, uh, it's. I would say that it's a nice problem to have when you have so much data and so many customers that you have to scale your technology. But I think it's uh, it's still very hard to like plan this and all this migration uh, stuff. So what were the like key factors that you noticed about the platform that you thought that maybe it's time to consider something else aside from uh, your current solution? Or was it just like constant innovations, like how how that works, data stack? So typically we have we, we you know we allocate 30, 20, 30, 40 percent of the time on R and D and innovation kind of stuff, right? So we always have uh, we are always on the lookout for something new, innovative technologies, and how to integrate and all that. That's what startups does, right? Now, all the all the tech companies does. So. Uh, you know, you always have to get ahead of you know if you're going to deploy something yeah you, you know that it's going to scale to ten thousand you know endpoints or locations tomorrow if you plan if you start doing it today you're already kind of late right so so we yeah. had always been um looking at and then we always have uh, our version one of the platform and the version two and the version three like we always are and you know as we learn we always find out you know how to scale how to and again scaling has different ways of scaling it right you can scale it if you can throw money at it and you can scale vertically. If money is not a problem, scaling is not a problem. But in the real world, money is always a problem. So you want to scale yeah. it uh, cost effectively and you know uh, and more efficiently. So so then we help. You know, our engineers did a good job by thinking through all the different challenges that we faced, always kind of iterating and planning ahead. Um, so that's how we have evolved and yeah to where we where we are today. Nice. Uh, I've been a part of a uh, few data migrations myself. And uh, when I think about that, I would say that uh, I'd like to highlight a few points and then run through you uh, if you think they are like re relevant on what you would like to add here. So I think when you plan migration, it's actually a lot of things you don't really consider if you actually have a running business that you need to like think of the scopes, why you're doing that. As you said, like money is always uh, something you need to take into account. So like the costs, the timeline, the, like the goals, and then reviewing, did you actually achieve that? 
it's uh, not really hard in a sense of a hard skill or like it's not a te technical side of the transition, but it also takes a lot of time and uh, sometimes it's uh, more troublesome than actually just switching technologies. And uh, just evaluating your current architecture and figuring out what you want from that and uh, how you move forward is also sometimes a very hard task, uh, I would say. And then you would also need to think like, when would it make sense to make this transition? Like how to do uh, the transition in a way that if uh, if it fails, we can get back to some of the systems. So I think it's a very interesting approach that you have like multiple system at the same time and you have like constant learning of r and I think it's, uh, it's a very good strategy from the sound of it. Uh, but then, yeah, once you deliver something to a new uh, system, you need to be sure that your stuff is valid and you need to, a way to test it. And like data testing is basically still non-existent thing. It's very hard to test stuff in a way that uh, typical software engineers test their code. It's like very rarely you can get the same level of um, certainty when you deploy your pipelines you always test your stuff in production basically and then you need to like to plan gradual decommission and establish some monitor and alerting on new stuff as well as old stuff and uh, then there are a lot of pain points like you don't want your data to uh, stop arriving or you, you don't want to lose any of that if there is a lineage you don't want to avoid that of course you don't want any corruption and so on and but uh, the other thing is that's I think really important and often overlooked that if you just switch to new hype technology and then like all the nice engineers uh, would go from you to some other place then you like lost uh, in a situation when it's like there's some skill gaps we need to share the knowledge and you, you like if the technology is new, then it's sometimes hard to find uh, uh, just uh, uh, experienced engineers with that experience to that particular stack. So yeah, and then we can talk about data security things for, for example, probably for another webinar or so. But uh, like, what would you say would you like to add here? Like, uh, what resonates with you in your data journey with uh, Spectro and Snowflake? Yeah, like I, uh, you know, or myself or our team is a big believer in not using too much, too many different technology stacks. So we would like to consolidate and, you know, use probably one or two, like, you know, the ideal ones, right, rather than, you know, like doing using different kind of data like solutions, for example, is not something that we want. And then um, there are so many out there, like, uh, it was not like 10 years ago when we started, there are so many different data, like, solutions out there that is that's already there. So choosing the right one. And then sometimes, you know, as engineers, you always tend to, oh, I can do it all my, my by, by myself because it's open source and all that. So we always look at, um, uh, you know, we have done it, we have learned it in the hardware. We always try to look at now the managed solutions. So that I think you kind of uh, pointed out there skill gaps and integration challenges. So if you, get a managed solution it's a lot easier because you don't have to worry about the uptime of your uh, infrastructure and you know making sure it is running patching it you know all that kind of stuff and then you can just really focus on your data pipelines and integration to your um, data science notebooks or uh, the insights generation part right so so yeah that's my two cents uh, when it comes to uh, thinking like the pain points and things that you should consider Interesting. Uh, but we talked a bit about pain points, but if you flip it around, like whether anything that was surprising when you switched to like ClickHouse, for example, uh, in the setup that you would not expect to happen. Yeah, so uh, we started off, uh, you know, I, don't, I think one of our architects, he came across ClickHouse and he said we should evaluate. So that's when we reached out to the cloud. And then we started the surprising part. One, one I will say is uh, we started the proof of concept, and within like within like a month or something, we were able to have everything up and running with your awesome support that you mentioned, right? So we <laughs> it was a team effort, and we were able to do that. And then uh, we were able to achieve uh, the same results as Snowflake, or even slightly better, right? So sub second query performance, uh, and being able to uh not make many changes to the data pipeline being able to do that so that was impressive i would say um yeah was there something particular that was uh like the 
the thing that made you make sure to go to trust in the technology? Yeah, so we, I think I mentioned like when we were considering uh, a solution, we were looking for a managed solution, right? So we don't have to manage it, just less a pain for us uh, so that we don't have to manage infrastructure. Cost was another thing. So cost, you know, scaling it in a cost effective way uh, was a thing. And then uh, near real time data. So with the previous solutions that we had, we had to move around data quite a bit. So Oh, so so the, it was not really near real time. So because of there'll be there'll be a there'll be a delay before you can actually look at your dashboards or insights and things like that. So um, uh, it checked those three uh, things that three or four things that we had, and uh, and we made a decision to like move forward with the uh, you know uh, migration with the to the double clock click ops. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's. I'm I'm glad that it resonates with my vision how the process should go and you sort of confirm my understanding of this. So I learned a few things, so like validated some of my ideas. So it's a it's good learning experience for me. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you mentioned real time data, and uh, for real time data, I listed a few things that uh, I'd like to point out that people, especially nowadays, think that uh, they need real time data often. Uh, like they don't really consider how much uh, challenges it brings when you decided to implement it. Like you mentioned that data volume is always rising with real-time data. It's much more important that you save all the incoming information and uh, you need to manage waste when like you have additional spikes because of your pipeline. Like can, data can arrive uh, non-monotonically or just... Uh, with some additional uh, splices of data every now and then when you have some synchroniz synchronization between that. And you basically need uh, your infrastructure to be able to handle this. And uh, you want to be sure that when you don't get, have data for a reasonable amount of time, like what is the problem here, you need to understand like what are the latencies, what are the expected processing times. So it takes much more effort to build this uh, process in a proper way compared to just like batch processing when you don't really care if your task takes like three hours or three hour, four hours or something like that. And then you need like to keep track of uh, consumer offsets, like uh, make sure that you read all the messages the way you want. And when you start talking to especially to management about different uh, delivery semantics. If you happen to, to, to talk with uh, some of those folks uh, uh, sometimes about that, then if you list that, well, there are like three ways we can set this up. We can set like at most once delivery, at least once delivery and exactly once. Everyone would say like, well, we want exactly once. We don't want anything else. We just want that because that's like, makes a lot of sense when you think about this uh, in your mind, but in reality, it's very complex uh, setup and it's very like easy to break. And it's much easier to just set up a system that will like manage duplicates when they arrive or after they actually get delivered to the uh, pipeline when you can afford it. So I think there are a few typical problems with uh, real-time data that uh, I would like to highlight. That is uh, exp very expensive to manage and expensive here. I mean, uh, not just money, but uh, also like risks in terms of data, data risks, basically. And you need experienced infrastructure team to be able to like handle all the situations because uh, there is this like, it is still sort of an emerging uh, branch of data engineering. And there are many, in many places uh, for like, data that is not expected to come through the pipeline, there might not be just uh, enough of best practices. And you have to come up with your own and you have to have like experience team. And uh, you basically, usually your team is mostly interested in delivering features, not like fixing the infrastructure things. So it's like uh, always challenging to have that uh, and not bring more technical depth in the process. And yeah, sometimes you just uh, change your data pipelines in a way that's un unrecoverable and you have to stick with that. So you want to be sure that uh, your change is uh, justifiable, basically. It goes back a bit to planning. But I would say like this is the most, uh, uh, the things that I would consider if I were implementing some near real-time or like real-time data or streaming data, as I prefer to call it. Uh, yeah, so what would you say, like, with your experience with real-time capabilities, uh, what the, 
was this integration uh, of ClickHouse, did it enhance your real-time processing or like did you start looking at other places? Like how was that uh, in your situation? So in our case, we don't do, for, for us, we don't do any mission critical um, kind of applications uh, that much. But so near real-time was not at the top of the list uh, for us initially. Uh, but, you know, when, you know, COVID started, you know, like uh, a few years ago, um, we started getting some um, things on occupancy monitoring. So, which was, you know, two, three years ago. So you want to know how many people are in a location before you want to like, go into a grocery store. You don't want to go there, right, kind of stuff. Uh, so that would require some near real-time data, right, because you don't want to be completely off and you can't, you know, one hour's data now is is useless <laughs> or, or doesn't make sense, right? Um, so then that's when we started to get into this. So by having the near real-time data with no, with the um, uh, ClickHouse, uh, we were able to open up some of the use cases like that. And then we have started seeing uh, similar kind of use cases in you know different um, uh, applications or different locations, different use cases, I should say, scenarios. Uh, as well and um yeah like and um some of the things that you mentioned yeah ha uh having an infrastructure for ingesting your real-time data has its own challenges like you can imagine like in our case it's 160,000 locations and there is data stream coming in through so you know how do you manage them how do you you know uh scale them you know because you want you know you want the real-time data for each location right so you know if if the queues start to grow bigger and all that it becomes a challenge yeah, and uh, so the speed and efficiency and able to, and for data, this is one other thing, right? You want it to be actionable. So you want the insights to be more precise and actionable. So so that was also the thing. So we were able to unlock new uh, applications and use cases uh, by having this capability. And then, and we are also do, we are also glad that we are able to do it in a very cost-effective way uh, because of ClickHouse and the book cloud, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that uh, sounded a bit like a marketing <laughs> pitch, but <laughs> it's true. ClickHouse is yeah. uh, usually very predictable in terms of costs and nice at scaling. Uh, so yeah, for folks, if you're interested in learning more about uh, how the changes in the architecture, we have a blog post on our website of uh, that goes in a bit more, more details on what was the previous architecture, what's current architecture, some benchmarks around that and the reasoning. And uh, yes, uh, as I see from just looking at those two pictures, um, and like obviously I read the article, so I kind of know the answers, but one thing that strikes me is that like the pipeline uh, was much more diverse in a sense before you switch to the current architecture. Like, did you saw any like benefits from this like streamlining uh, of this approach? Like, what what was the main takeaway here? Could you comment on that, please? Yeah. So, I um, mean, um, if you go, if you see the previous architecture, we had to move around data from you know the data data lake or data warehouse to uh, other locations so that we can uh, like RDS for driving the visualization of dashboard because um, if you run um, the Snowflake 24-7, you know, with uh, like a lot of uh, uh, driving different kind of visualization, it would really cost us a lot of a lot of money. So it wouldn't be really cost effective, I should say. Um, so we were looking at something that uh, we could do without moving around the data. So there is also the data governance piece, right? So if you start copying or moving around the data to different places, uh, when you want to do like a data subject request, you have to go look at all the places and, you know, we, we implemented all that before. So it actually simplified it for us to do the DSR requests and things like that um, and data governance and things like that and have better governance and stuff. So that actually simplified. And obviously, like I mentioned before, also like it is more cost effective as well and, and providing the near real time capability as well, right? Because you know, if you if you see the previous architecture, the data will come in, come into the data lake. You know, we do some pre-processing or post-processing, and then we move it into the RDS. Then it will become available through to the insights and visualization or dashboards. But in this case, it's it's near real time. It just shows up. You don't have to do uh, any um, in the ETL jobs in between to uh, for that. So that actually helps us 
maintain things and all the things better, right? It's lesser lesser pain points for us uh, yeah. to develop and maintain. That's uh, good to hear. And I, I guess, like, again, if you have less pain points and it's easier to scale and uh, hopefully there would be no more COVIDs in the near time, but uh, you will have more reasons to scale that. And uh, that's nice to hear. Uh, speaking of just like in general uh, of this sort of pipelines, uh, would you say that, uh, like, I, I recently listened to this uh, podcast by uh, Confluent, uh, which is like a couple of years ago, uh, kind of after COVID in a sense, uh, they were like posting a really interesting question, like if streaming is answered, why are we still doing batch? And that got me thinking that, well, sometimes you don't really need that. But uh, if we're talking about streaming at uh, Spectre, would you say that there are like some tooling gaps that you see that like you, you would... Um, want to address like that they bring the pain points at, at right right now for your data infrastructure in terms of streaming of course yeah i think uh, if we have better uh tools for data ingestion and doing that in in scale like so you know like like there are hundreds of thousands of uh locations now like what if it is you know millions of locations right how would we how would how would we do that and then you know like so having some uh, managed services or tools like that, and then ability to connect to more um, data sources, you know, or databases like to, to bring in and ingest data, like even legacy. So, you know, sometimes we have legacy things too, so that that would help. Uh, because we kind of our our platform has the ability to correlate everything to to generate insight, right? Because if you look at data like in silos, it doesn't mean anything. But when you tie everything together, you get the full journey, right? Like everything. So get a full 360 degree view of what is going on. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, so if if we say like there is a magical data fairy that just uh, comes to you and uh, like waves the magic wand and says like, now you're happy about your data platform. What would be the change that this fairy would produce maybe? Or like, what would you notice about your, your like ideal magical data platform what that consists of i mean if there is something like that you know uh and maybe someday it'll happen then we can purely um focus on you know generating more insights from the data and and all that right, right now again with the help from uh i don't say that with the help from double cloud and clickhouse we are pretty we are pretty uh happy with what we have and it's able to meet most of the requirements uh you know, uh, what we have today. Uh, but again, we don't know what is tomorrow, right? So, but it the, there was something like this, you know, you don't need, you won't need to worry about anything. Data just shows up and everything is magical. You don't have to worry about scaling, anything like that. But then you would definitely focus on the storytelling from the data, right? And then the AI ML models that you could um, do better things with data and uh, actionable insights with data. Yeah, I like that uh, we can agree that more magic is better <laughs> in a sense that you you don't really want to. I think there was a cool phrase about that, that you don't really want to know how the sausages are made in yeah. terms of data stuff. Like you want to solve your problems and then like the nitty gritty details, you don't really want to know that. Uh, are there any particular like features with uh, ClickHouse or that double cloud offering that you're like excited about or planning to incorporate once they actually coming out uh, in your like inspector operations? Yeah, I, like I mentioned, I think we are um, having new data connectors and things. We are definitely interested in trying out. We we did try out a different ones already. But if there are new ones coming out, then we will definitely want to try that out. We're already using the data ingestion service, um, so the data pipeline. So maybe the next generation of data pipeline, we more, you know, it's even better compared to today. So we'll be happy to try that out, and we are eagerly waiting for that <laughs> or anything that uh, Double Cloud is going to launch in that aspect. Um, yeah. yeah. I, the, the other day, I just checked the transfer team backlog, and it was like. <laughs> Very scary to see, uh, but then again, very excited uh, to see that there are some features that uh, would be nice to have in the future regarding like integration with other system and some absolutely uh, improvements and uh, yeah, those nice things. Uh, yeah, so speaking of 
like you, you talked a lot about that uh, adding streaming and near real time data un basically unlocked a new like branch of things you can do. Uh, do you think you would be uh, Spectre would be able to do that if it just focused on batching? Like uh, how, how different would that be in terms of I don't know. Uh, costs, uh, scaling, complexity? So right now we actually use a, a mix of both, right? So certain type of data you don't need near real time. Uh, for example, diagnostic information and things like that, we don't need it in real time. So we kind of batch them. But certain things, if you want to take action on, we want to have near real time data. Um, uh, so we kind of already do that. and. Uh, by having the near real-time data, we will be able to do more um, uh, different kind of applications. For example, like you know, really personalizing and targeting uh, content based on you know all the historical data. For example, we we already do that today, but in a more uh, how to say it, like a more uh, data, you know. Uh, more more coming from the historical data, what have been the customers' behaviors, what would work in certain type of uh, target groups and things like that. We'll be able to do that with the in real time uh, kind of uh, kind of data and uh, uh, pipeline. I should say. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's a, like uh, from the. Uh, it was very cautious, so I would not probe more uh, about this. But it's uh, nice to say, nice to hear uh, that uh, like you have a particular uh, understanding that is uh, like how to grow those uh, uh, parts of your data platform. Uh, if you were to give, I don't know, any advice to someone who is trying to switch from batch data to streaming data, or like someone who's considering doing streaming uh, real time data platform would be would it be something that you would like to like advice to those people i don't know um uh my advice would be like to kind of look at your current and future needs because sometimes you know you also want to consider the future um and uh, you also you know you, you've got to classify the type of data as well right so what kind of data you need for streaming right like like i mentioned to you we we do both uh, so you've got to classify the data types and then see what you do. You know, you can dump everything in real time for sure, but, uh, uh, you know, it has, you know, it's, it's expensive in terms of cost, your infrastructure, resources that is needed, things like that. So you kind of, if you classify it, uh, to different type of different data types and then see what are the, what are the metrics or information that you need, uh, is near real time, then, you know, uh, architect around that and then set up your data pipelines and things around that uh, and choose the right solution to right so that would fit your current and future needs because migrations is not easy changing technology i mean nothing is forever but you don't want to touch on anything uh, at least for the next uh, four or five years right so or three to five years yeah that's that's something you'll have to consider as well when considering uh, streaming or fast processing and all that, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's a good point. I have like genuinely good points. Thanks for sharing. Uh, all right, yeah, I think we are towards the end of our uh, talk uh, today. Uh, please uh, join uh, our Slack and uh, Double Cloud LinkedIn and join Spectre LinkedIn to learn more about what's company doing and what are the plans. And uh, feel free to add me and Shailesh on LinkedIn and uh, to reach out or to uh, just to chat, I guess, uh, about tech stuff. Uh, if we have any questions, uh, now is time to ask them. And uh, yeah, right now I don't actually see any particular questions in the chat or in the Q&A panel. Uh, but... Uh, I'm personally curious. I once heard a story like 10 years ago, I guess. Uh, there was a proposal that uh, you can actually track uh, the billboards uh, that are uh, out on like on the outskirts of a town, for example. You have a billboard that just like swaps the 
uh, advertisement. Mm -hmm. And then you can sort of track if it, that, that thing will have Wi-Fi and then someone in the car would be, would it be possible to trigger that someone actually saw particular advertisement and then that person uh, decided to visit a particular mall that was nearby. Is that sort of thing that's actually possible with the like the digital signatures and uh, all these things around us, or is it like crazy conspiracy theory? That is that is possible. So uh, I think there are you know two or three um, large companies that actually does billboards across the world. Uh, Clear Channel is one. Lamar, uh, JC Deco, like this, this companies like that who actually do that. So they do try a company. Uh, how many people drove by, right? That's based on that, how they charge the advertisers, you know, what kind of exposure the ad will get, right? So that's like where they started like many, many years ago. Now you actually go do a lot more stuff, you know, uh, how many keep, how many cars drove by, what is the model and make of the car? How many people was inside, mm -hmm. like you know, all that kind of stuff. How many people was inside? That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds very exciting, but... <laughs> A bit concerning on the other hand. The the advertising, digital out of home advertising is uh, growing um like a by a lot because uh of a lot of things that is happening in the online world. Uh cookies cookies are going away, the ability to track um you know users on the phone is not that easy anymore. So it everybody's going being targeted because and in uh in home uh, advertising, right? Like your TV ads and all that. You don't watch so much TV anymore. You are mostly on your phone, tablets, and things like that. So, out of home advertising is is booming right now because of all this. Yeah, I think I saw once a talk at a data science conference when they were explaining how they track the attendance for the like cinemas that actually the screen has like a video camera on top of it that sort of tracks how many people are sitting and how they react to advertisement. When it's shown and it was like I I did I felt a bit weird about going to cinema for a while yeah. after learning about this thing. So yeah. But in the end it brings better advertisement, I guess, uh, in a sense. Uh yeah, we have uh, my curiosity raised a few concerns with our participants. Uh people just wanted to say thanks, and then there is a question. If the video surveillance data from panels and malls track people, yeah, I guess if it does, we wouldn't really know that. Or like if it gets out of uh, like, so, yeah. Do you want me to answer this? Some of them do, uh, and there is uh, privacy laws and everything around that, right? So you're not supposed to uh, put up a camera without uh, the customers knowing. So you got to put up signs to say that. Um, you know, that it's being, uh, you're being like, you know, if you go walk into a store, they'll put in a sign saying that there's a security surveillance system in the store. It's for security mm. purposes. So they have to let you know that you, mm. you're to do it. And you're not allowed to, again, legally, you're not allowed to store your videos or anything like that. It's more anonymized data. It'll be like this many people walk by mm. and this age group, this kind of gender. You know, that's what typically that is being tra tracked, you know, or, you know, collected. Yeah, interesting. Like, I had a, a, sometimes I do like tricks with advertisement when I just turn off all the ad blockers that I have and just like try to set up the default viewer experience. And then I get uh, very annoyed that I don't get personal ads. So I guess there is, a uh, better future somewhere. And I, I'm glad that uh, your company does that in a way that sort of sounds reasonable <laughs> to expect that those personalized data would be usable. Yeah, the uh, way we do it is we do it everything on the edge. Uh, we don't store any, mm -hmm. we don't send any videos back to the cloud. We do everything on the edge. Uh, there is no videos being tracked. There's only the metadata or the metrics that we store. Uh, and we also have a radar uh, solution, which is non-camera based. It's oh. it's based on radar technology, which is RF. Um, so some people who are more concerned about their customers' privacy and all that use that solution instead of camera. So we, we you know. Uh, I have a lot of questions like that, but uh, yeah. I think we can uh, afford one last question. And there is uh, one from the chat. 
Uh, I have a batch data and real time running daily. How will you integrate it in a single pipeline? Uh, well, I, I can answer that first and then uh, you can uh, follow up if you want to add something. So uh, there are two ways you can do it. I would say that uh, one of the more uh, modern path is this so-called Kappa architecture when you have your batch data actually streamed in the uh, real-time pipeline and then you will have some sort of accumulator that then will like collect the data in the batch and then send it to real time and then you will integrate it uh, basically just a single real time pipeline but make sure you account for those spikes that's uh, one of the ways how that can be achieved uh, that just comes from on top of my head what do you think shadesh yeah i mean i, I agree like if you can use a kafka uh, queue for the real time data and then maybe um for the other type of uh, the batch data you could use um, you know firehose uh, or something like that to uh, with an API endpoint to ingest data, batch data, so compressed batch process data. I would say that uh, generally speaking, it's a very like generic uh, yeah. option, and depending on the data and uh, like the relative size of that data, there would be maybe reasons to actually have two systems to do that, or just uh, force to have it uh, one. But uh, and anyway, setting this up might take uh, some time and. Uh, we suggest you check out Double Cloud for <laughs> ways to do it in a managed fashion if you don't want to get to uh, tra transform yourself to DevOps uh, pr practitioner. All right, so I think that's that's about it. Uh, I'd like to thank Yushalesh for joining me here and uh, discussing this. And uh, thanks everyone for uh, joining the webinar. Uh, we will send the recording in a couple of days and uh, there would be like the slide deck available to you as well. And uh, yeah, uh, reach out to Slack, connect to us and um, we'll be looking forward to seeing you at our next webinars. Yeah, thank you for having me here. So thank you everyone.